and we are live. Wow, this is cool. It's like I can see everyone uh, filtering in. Um, yeah, I have no idea how I'm going to follow that <laughs> because I cannot uh, sing and I cannot rap um, and uh, I don't have any presents to open. Um, but I'm still super, super excited to share this talk with all of you um, because today I'm going to talk about our path forwards towards Tendermint 1.0 at long last. Um, so first things first, my name is Tess and I am the VP of Engineering at Interchain GmbH, where I focus on Tendermint Core. Um, and just as a heads up, today I'm running my slides using Keynote, which means that I can't see the chat in the like crowdcast thing um, while I'm presenting. It's just like it's like all Keynote for me. Um, so that means that I I, I uh, I'm just going to ask everyone to like drop questions into the chat, and then um, I should have about five minutes at the end to take questions. So um, so cool. So. I want to begin by going very briefly over some of the history of Tendermint Core, and then I'll talk about where we are today, and I'll highlight a few of the major changes that have been released this year. And then with that context in mind, I'll dig into our plans for a 1.0 release. So today, Tendermint Core is already being used to secure more than a billion dollars across many blockchains and many projects, and we're just so excited to start finally moving towards this 1.0 release that will reflect the project's maturity and promise. Um, so here's the history. Uh, Jay Kwan started Tendermint Core in 2014 as like a one-man project. And the first Tendermint white paper, which was titled Consensus Without Mining, was published shortly thereafter. And although it may sound a little bit milk toast now, the idea that you could run a public blockchain without proof of work was pretty novel at the time. So this Tendermint white paper drew on research from academic computer science to present a completely new approach to Byzantine fault tolerant consensus for public networks. The following year in 2015, the Tendermint socket protocol or TMSP was introduced. Now, you probably know this now as ABCI, or the Application Blockchain Interface. Um, and this is also a pretty substantial feature. So ABCI lets any deterministic state machine use Tendermint for replication. And it made Tendermint consensus dramatically more accessible for a wider range of applications. In August 2016, the Cosmos white paper was published. Now, if you're tuned in to entertain conversations today, you're probably pretty familiar with this white paper because it outlined the original vision for a Tendermint-powered internet of blockchains, or you know, the interchain. Uh, the Cosmos Hub, which began to actually realize that vision, was launched three years later in 2019. But along the way, another important Tendermint white paper was published. This one by Jay Kwan, Ethan Buckman, and Zarko Milos. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Zarko. Zarko Milosevic. Um, it was called The Latest Gossip on BFT Consensus, and it presented Tendermint Core in a more formal way and helped popularize Tendermint Consensus as a tool among academic researchers, uh, especially those in distributed systems. So all of this brings us to this year, 2020, and I want to expand a little bit on both of the events um, here at the end of the timeline. So first, um, towards the start of this year, 2020, Interchain GmbH was formed, and we are a new company owned by the Interchain Foundation and staffed largely by alumni from Tendermint Inc. And our mission really is to work in lockstep with the foundation and to steward the core technologies that underpin the Cosmos ecosystem. And that's really all we do. In fact, of the 14 Interchain GmbH employees, 11 of us are engineers. So from day one, we have just been laser focused on building and maintaining the software that constitutes Tendermint Core and IBC. In 2021, we're also beginning to build a new engineering team to focus on developing Gaia and maintaining the Cosmos Hub, but that's a talk for another time. Um, Tendermint Core's big win in 2020 has been the release of Tendermint Core 034 which is also the release that will support the Cosmos Stargate upgrade. If you're not familiar with Stargate, let me just catch you up very briefly. 
because it has been this massive and coordinated effort across the ecosystem. The Stargate upgrade will be the change that will actually introduce IBC to the Cosmos hub, but it's also just this massively breaking change because it changes Tendermint and Cosmos's encoding format. That is the serializ serialization format that's used as a wire format and as a data storage format. So the Stargate upgrade will change this wire format from something that was written in-house to something that is standard, stable, well-maintained, and just a bit more performant. And this change impacts projects all the way up the stack from Tendermint Core to the Cosmos SDK to Gaia to clients and wallets and partners. Now, the details of Stargate are also another talk. Um, and in fact, we have a blog post that outlines this particular um, decision and its ramifications for Tendermint Core engineers or for engineers working with Tendermint Core. Um, and I'll share these slides publicly after the talks. So you can just like click on all these links. Um, but the thing to understand about Stargate is that it's been this enormous ecosystem effort um, and actually that it's still ongoing. So Stargate really is comprised of a series of releases um, from each core Cosmos project. And it won't really be complete until they're all live on the Cosmos hub. But the exciting news as far as Tendermint Core is concerned is that Tendermint Core 034, uh, which was released last month, is the Tendermint Core release for Stargate. So it is Stargate ready, we are Stargate ready, we're ready to go. Like other Stargate compatible components, Tendermint Core adopts protocol buffers, that standard serial serialization format I mentioned earlier. Um, and this has really led to big improvements in performance and in developer experience. Uh, in fact, one of our users, Bakadoni, has reported a 58% improvement in the throughput of their blockchain, which is part of their voting and governance toolkit. But Tendermint Core 034 isn't just a big encoding change. It also introduces a pair of important and highly anticipated features. So one of these features is what we're calling state sync. State sync lets new nodes join pre-existing networks by replaying application state rather than by replaying all of the blocks in the blockchain. So without state sync, it can take a new node days to catch up on a pre-existing network. But with state sync, it only takes a few minutes. So that's a huge, huge improvement. Tendermint Core 034 also introduces a new light client, uh, which we've rewritten with stronger security guarantees. So this is really critical for the safety and security of IBC, since the IBC relayer uses the Tendermint light client to verify that packets have been included on both sides of an IBC transaction. Finally, uh, the introduction of a new light client means the introduction of like a bit of a new attack surface for Byzantine behavior. So consequently, we've completely revisited the way that Tendermint Core handles evidence of misbehavior, and we've given the light client ways to identify malicious behavior and then report it to full nodes who can then come to consensus and uh, hold any misbehaving parties accountable. So state sync, the new light client, and the protocol buffer migration are some of the major new features included in Tendermint 034 but there are also more than 100 bug fixes, performance improvements, optimizations, simplifications, refactors, so on and so forth. Um, so to see them all, they're all in our change log, uh, which I think is actually the largest Tendermint Core change log to date. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to my team. I'm super, super proud of the team that has done this work, not only for everyone's diligent engineering, but also just for the time that everyone has taken to answer community questions in Discord, to triage issues open on GitHub, um, you know, to write blog posts and documentation, and just to really like invest back in the community to make sure that everyone can, can make the most of everything coming out in Tendermint 034. So <clears throat> what's next? Well, as we were working on the Stargate release, we began to notice a theme. And that theme, frankly, was that this Stargate upgrade was going to be a little bit painful, uh, pretty painful for a lot of our users. And this wasn't great, right? Although Tendermint has been pre 1.0 and like Ethan mentioned earlier, has pretty consistently labeled itself as alpha or beta software, something about this just didn't seem right, right? 
Like after all, we know that Tendermint Core is used to secure, honestly, an enormous amount of value across several major blockchain ecosystems. And it just became clear that our users deserve to have a production grade consensus engine with production level stability guarantees for all of its public interfaces. So one way to get there is through semantic versioning or SEMVAR. And for a while now, or you know, at least as long as I've been working on the project, uh, sometime before as well, um, Tendermint Core has been following this sort of like loose semantic versioning scheme. So this is what it says on our readme about our versioning guarantees. Tendermint uses semantic versioning. According to SEMVAR, anything in the public API can change at any time before version 1.0. To provide some stability to Tendermint users in these O.X.X days, the minor version is used to signal breaking changes across a subset of the total public API. This subset includes all interfaces exposed to other processes, CLI, RPC, peer-to-peer, -peer, et cetera, but does not include the Go APIs. In the upgrading section of the readme, we continue. In an effort to avoid accumulating technical debt prior to 0.0.0, we do not guarantee that breaking changes, i.e. bumps in the minor version, will work with the existing Tendermint blockchains. In these cases, you will have to start a new blockchain or write something custom to get the old data into the new chain. Now, that may sound reasonably orderly, but we've discovered that it has some problems. So some of these problems are a bit, um, forgive me, but they're a bit semantic, since SEMVAR isn't really meant to be used in a pre 1.0 state for seven years <laughs> and for you know, these major in production products. Um, and so some examples of how that kind of started to fall apart were that we were started, <laughs> excuse me, some examples of how that started to fall apart were that we, we were calling um, minor releases, major releases, because they contained the kinds of changes that you'd expect to see in major releases, um, even though we couldn't use this versioning scheme to reflect that. And then at the same time, we started using the patch number, which is the third number in this uh, SEMVAR scheme, to reflect changes that were really meant for minor releases. So all this is kind of like lost all meaning for us, right? But the bigger problem, of course, is that this doesn't make any guarantees at all. We don't have any real mechanism for signaling the kinds of changes that we were making in various releases, leaving all of our users to like pour over these change logs and to just ask lots of confused questions in Discord and on GitHub. And we know that this isn't the kind of user experience that we want to provide. So with that in mind, we started thinking seriously about Tendermint 1.0 and the kinds of guarantees that would come along with that. Now, before I share any specific roadmap items with you, I wanna talk about what it means to reach 1.0. So sometimes people expect 1.0 software to be finished, complete, you know, with every feature any user could ever want. And you know, if you're a long time Tendermint user or contributor, you may be familiar with a GitHub milestone we have called a Tendermint 1.0 wishlist, which has 351 items on it. But, that is not our to-do list for Tendermint 1.0. Our guiding principle here is not to add all of the features we will ever want or to make every improvement that we wanna see. Rather, we're really just trying to focus on the work that we need to do before we can stabilize those public APIs. So we're focusing on building a Tendermint 1.0 that is stable, secure, performant, and ergonomic. And now I will show you how we're going to achieve those things. So to start, we've begun by considering some high priority changes to the consensus and block protocols. One major change is to the way that Tendermint handles block time. So right now, the block's timestamp is the median of the timestamps in pre-commits from all of the validators who have pre-committed to this block. I know, it's a lot. Um, but for increased light client security, we wanna switch this timestamp so that it comes only from the block proposer. So other validators would then be expected to only vote for the block if its timestamp is within some range of its own clock. And this will introduce tighter constraints around clock uh, synchronization across the network, but it's really useful for running accountability protocols on certain kinds of light client attacks 
And this also really helps set the stage for future work on signature aggregation. Um, we're also looking at making some updates to our block execution model and block headers. Uh, these things have been requested by some Tendermint users and it, it hasn't been fully evaluated or designed yet, but we're considering, for example, adding an additional block processing phase that would give applications more control over, block, over how blocks are handled over the course of a round of consensus. And similar, similarly, we're considering removing redundant fields from our commit sig and vote objects, although we're also you know, still evaluating that. Um, lastly, we have decided to adopt ZIP215, which is actually a proposal from the Zcash ecosystem. So ZIP215 standardizes the validation rules across the many languages and many implementations of the ED25519 uh, crypto libraries. And if you're curious about that, um, Henry de Valence from the Zcash Foundation will be speaking more about that proposal and the problem it's solving uh, later today. But we're not looking only at the protocols, of course. We're also taking this time to really polish our interfaces. So ABCI, the application blockchain interface, is also ready to reach 1.0. Um, I've heard some people call it ABCI 2.0 because it's like it's just like so uh, exciting and kind of like next gen. Um, but it's actually it's actually going to be 1.0. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're currently working with the teams at uh, Sika and Lazy Ledger to revamp ABCI. Well, you know, just like incorporating all the things we've learned since ABCI was first introduced five years ago. Um, and we really expect that this next generation of ABCI is going to be both simpler and more flexible than ever. And if you're curious about this, um, Dev Oja will be sharing the proposal from Sika later today. And we're still like kind of hammering out all the details with them about like exactly how it should work and what it should look like. Um, but we do expect that we're going to head in more or less that direction with ABCI 1.0. Um, the Go APIs are also undergoing a major stability push. So we want to be completely committed to our public Go interfaces. And as a part of this, we're going to actually internalize a lot of the currently exported Go API, particularly the functions and the types which are likely to change in the future. So this particular change will only impact you if you use Tendermint Core as a Go library. Um, and we'll also be working proactively with users and teams to best understand which parts of our APIs uh, we might need to keep public. As part of the stability push, we're also focusing on making our internal components as modular as possible, while at the same time keeping those component to component interfaces private. So we might one day expose a lot of these internal interfaces, which would be necessary for pluggable components, um, but we're going to keep them private leading up to the 1.0 release. So in the 1.0 release, we're going to be refactoring several key components, and I'll share more about that in a moment, of course, um, but this decision to kind of limit pluggability is going to really just leave us more room to operate and will ultimately help us build confidence in these interfaces before we make any of them public. And again, this really only applies uh, to the Go APIs. Um, we are also going to adopt gRPC for communication between Tendermint and the signing tooling known as Privalve. And we'll be evaluating the possibility of adopting gRPC more widely across our entire RPC layer. Um, finally, we'll be investing in increasing the range of changes that can happen through soft upgrades through a mix of upgrade tooling and uh, likely some more aggressive versioning as well. Um, and this is also currently being designed. And there's actually an RFC open on the spec repo right now, uh, if anyone wants to take a sneak peek. Speaking of the spec, we're really investing there too, working with the team over at Informal Systems. So the Informal team is working on a Rust implementation of Tendermint. Um, again, I believe there is a talk or maybe multiple talks uh, later today about their work on that Rust implementation. Um, and we just work with them on pretty much every change to the Tendermint spec. So we've been working right now on ensuring that both implementations share a common and language agnostic spec and that that spec is versioned according to semantic versioning. Similarly, we want to make sure that our user-facing documentation is semantically versioned as well. Or 1.0 is also going to include some big performance improvements. 
So a major piece of this is going to come from the mempool because we're going to invest heavily in a redesign and refactor. So earlier this year, uh, the community ran an incentivized testnet called Game of Zones. And Game of Zones put a lot of performance demands on the Cosmos and Tendermint code. Um, and we learned that the current Tendermint mempool is going to suffer if you put it under that kind of load. So as the Cosmos network grows, we're just going to need a more sophisticated mempool that can load shed and prioritize transactions. And we'll also be seeking um, feedback from users here to ensure that the new to ensure that the new mempool can support like a wider um, and more sophisticated range of application needs. Um, as part of our performance push, of course, we'll be benchmarking Tendermint Core um, and tracking our scalability and performance goals to make sure that we can support um, the next generation of Cosmos and other high load networks uh, like Terra. Um, and then finally, in the performance uh, category, we have some low level improvements that we already know we want to make, like changing the encoding we use for database keys um, so that we can do more efficient range scans. Some of the most critical work that's going into Tendermint 1.0 is motivated by increasing the safety and security of the system. So this is often wide ranging and very ambitious work as is the case with our ongoing refactor of the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So the current peer-to-peer -peer layer has been the source of the plurality of our security vulnerabilities this year. And so we're really investing in fixing it uh, from the ground up, beginning with a reimagining of all of the abstractions in this layer. So this will also fix a few design problems we've seen um, that originate in the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And these design problems uh, have created complexity throughout the Tendermint code base since this peer-to-peer -peer layer touches like every other component in Tendermint core. Um, and as an added bonus, this peer-to-peer -peer work will also lay the foundation for future innovation, such as adopting newer and more performant transport protocols like Quick. Um, and if you wanna see all the details about our thinking and planning on this peer-to-peer -peer work, uh, you can take a look at ADR 61 and 62, which are both uh, in the main Tendermint repo. But like I said, I'm gonna post these slides online so you'll be able to click on these links. <clears throat> um, okay, other upcoming security-oriented work uh, includes some follow-up work around evidence handling. So at the moment, a small number of attack types are automatically detected and reported. Um, excuse me, a small number of attack types on light clients specifically are automatically detected and reported, but ultimately have to be handled through operator intervention. And in the future, we'd like to give the network everything it needs to prosecute these very particular kinds of attacks automatically. We'll also be investing in accountability protocols that can deal with uh, misbehavior that happens sort of like across the upgrade boundary, um, which will be especially important uh, with IBC. Tendermint uh, 1.0 will also tackle a few small but you know annoying UX issues. Um, so some of these are in the light client um, because at the moment users don't always know where to find witness providers or trusted headers, which are two things that are just necessary to start the light client safely. So we want to remove any uncertainty about where to find these critical, critical uh, sources so that it'll just be really easy to start a new light client. We're also going to remove older versions of the blockchain reactor and unify all users around blockchain reactor v2, which is the latest one. Um, so productionizing this reactor um, and like unifying everyone around that should really also simplify the user experience pretty dramatically. Finally, um, we're verifying the correctness of our implementation through a variety of more advanced testing techniques. So we've recently added a new end-to-end -end testing suite that spins up short-lived test nets in a wide variety of possible configurations. Um, and we're also updating some old and honestly a little bit neglected Jepson tests to further verify the correctness of Tendermint, like just as a distributed system. Um, finally, we're also leveraging the formal verification work done by the informal team. Again, it's like a, uh, another topic that will be coming up later today, um, but we're leveraging some of their work to create model-based tests, uh, which really help verify that our implementations are correct and that they adhere to the formally verified specifications. Okay, so that is all a lot of stuff, um, but I hope you can see that we're staying really focused on those four themes that I mentioned earlier. This kind of focus does also mean that there are some things that we've deprioritized on the immediate roadmap, 
And although we may want to do some of these things eventually, uh, they didn't quite make the cut for Tendermint 1.0. Uh, finally, before I wrap up, I want to share with you a very estimated roadmap. So as you can see, we're actually planning on partitioning all this work into two uh, upcoming releases, Tendermint 035, which we expect to release sometime in the middle of next year, um, and then Tendermint 1.0, which we expect to release early the following year. And again, this is really an estimate. Um, since a lot of the changes that I've highlighted haven't been fully designed yet, it's just very difficult to commit to, to hard deadlines. Um, but this is, this is what we think will happen right now. So <clears throat> Tendermint Core 1.0 is all about investing in the basics. It's about ensuring that we have a stable and secure foundation that our users can really rely on. Uh, but it's also about creating a foundation for us that we can use for future cutting edge consensus work. And as we work towards Tendermint 1.0, we'll continue to explore new ideas and consensus with an eye towards Tendermint 2.0, 0, 3.0, and beyond. Okay, um, so that's basically all I've got. Thank you very much. Um, but before I take questions, I also have to, like I just must mention that we're active on Discord um, and that we always welcome issues and PRs on GitHub. Uh, we've tagged uh, beginner-friendly ones with good first issue. Um, and most, maybe most importantly, we are hiring. Um, we are looking for more engineers to join the core tournament team um, and uh, some of our other engineering teams as well. So you can see all of those jobs on our website at Interchain Berlin. Um, here is all of my contact info. And now I think I can get out of keynote dominated mode and see what the questions are, if there were any. Let's see. Stop my screen. That's fine too. Uh, serving the state sink, and why should he? Um, that is a really uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it is something sort of that like you have to decide to do for the good of the network. Um, and we don't really provide any like automatic incentives um, for people to um, to serve state sync, um, like the state sync snapshots is what I assume you're asking about. Um, so I kind of put that in the same category in some ways as some of the light client stuff that I mentioned, where people um, say that they uh, um, you know have trouble finding like like seed nodes or like persistent peers. So it's all kind of in that same category, um, you know, and we'll be working on it uh, as well. But yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's, it's definitely one of the like rougher edges around state sync right now. Um, let's see, what real world issue are you solving? So Tendermint Core is like a really low level protocol in a lot of ways. Um, and I think, you know, you can think of it as, you know, it's closely related to like a distributed database that has really strong replication guarantees. Um, you know, and so I think uh, I think it's it's more fun and more useful to talk to like people who are using it. You know, several layers up the stack and are doing really really interesting work with it. Um, and I know that there's talks from some of those folks happening later today as well. Let's see. Um, will we still station to station protocol? on peer-to-peer -peer or TLS or something. Um, what is, I don't quite understand this question. What is station to station protocol? Okay. I, I'm looking in the chat to see if anyone has a clarification on this. Um, I may be out of time before I can answer this question. Um, I will stick around in the chat on future conversations. And um, I'm also like on Twitter and I have my email address visible here. Um, so I'm happy to answer uh, this, this question as well. So um, yeah, so send me an email <laughs> or tweet at me, you know. Cool, uh, yeah, thank you so much.